activist or working in a scientist or marine biologist or whatever you're doing, it's always infinitely fascinating and inspiring to me how someone can take their passion and make a life's work out of it, but in a way that is so impactful and so forward thinking. Um, so every year, again, regardless of who it is, I just read through all the bios and I'm like, this is, this is just amazing. And I hope that everyone can find their thing, right? Their thing that makes, that, that drives them in that way. So when um, our guest this evening was selected as a MacArthur Fellow, also known as the Genius Grant, I was like, how appropriate, because I've been following his work for so long. So it's even more meaningful to me to be here tonight in this space, sharing um, in this genius together and um, celebrating this moment of us being able to be back together and have these incredible experiences in community again. And so to introduce our guest this evening, I want to introduce my colleague and friend, um, Elise Gonzalez, the director of Ruby City. Now, okay. Well, I am, I think that's a lovely introduction to the series and of course, Rick, to your genius. Uh, in the field, and so we're delighted to have you here. Thank you so much. As many of you already know, Rick is the founder of Project Row Houses, an extraordinary complex of shotgun houses in Houston that has truly transformed our idea of what art can be, taking into account not only art, but community involvement, and all with the idea of improving the daily lives of the individuals in this community in Third Ward in Houston. It's a predominantly black neighborhood. So. I just want to thank you, Rick, for being here and for being part of this series. But also, you know, the other thing that we've come to learn is that Rick has also been maintaining a very active painting practice over the past probably five to six years now. And so we'll be talking a little bit about that tonight. And I am delighted that we own actually one of Ruby City owns one of Rick's paintings that's currently on view in an exhibition tangible nothing that's on view through July of next year so you have plenty of time to come by and see it um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that painting but also but mostly I guess I just want to start at the beginning Rick and I am always very curious to know like how did you come to find art like did you did your parents make art did they go to see art museums? Did they go to art museums? Like, how did this come about? Okay. Well, well. Before I get to that question, uh, let me just uh, start by showing some appreciation for to Ruby City and Elise for, you know, trekking over to Houston to my studio to to check out my work and and making this decision to buy a piece. Grateful for that, and also grateful to be in this space again. Um, the last time I was in this space was, um, if it was probably just over 30 years and I was here as a guest of, uh, Esperanza, uh, and I'm glad to see Graciela here, which I haven't, it's been a long time since we've seen each other, you know, and then there's so many other people around here that I see that I'm just bringing back my San Antonio memories, you know, Penny Boyer, and then I've got some Houstonians that are connected here, Liz Ward and Rob Zabel. It's like, it's so great, you know, to be here and the, to be connecting with, uh, with folks that I haven't connected with in a while. So thank you for this evening and this opportunity. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, going to, oh wait, one other thing too, and there's a new Texan and I just told her the story that uh, uh, Lisa Abel, who's with the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, San Antonio Museum of Art, she just came down. I knew her from Chicago, met her recently. And I just told her the story about Texas that when, they told me when I first moved here in 85. They said, it's a big state. It's easy to get in, but it's hard to get out. So she'll be here for a while. So you know, she, she's not going anywhere. Um, so anyway, but for, for me, you know, I, I had no, uh, you know, I grew up in rural Alabama. You know, we didn't, you know, we didn't have art in schools and that kind of stuff. That was not something that was a, a, a part of my daily life. 
Um, I guess I did know that I had some kind of artistic abilities because, you know, whenever it was mostly not in art classes, but like in social science, you know, whenever they, you had to do like drawings of the maps of the states or something like that, or, you know, little social studies projects and stuff, I could, I was always the person that people would ask to do it, you know, and I, I could do it a little bit, but not so, I wasn't so, so great. My big thing, I was a basketball player. And so that was what I spent all of my time doing. And, uh, but when I went to college to play basketball and found myself kind of being a little disenchanted when I started, you know, going from a little small county school where me being 5'11 wasn't so bad, but getting onto the college level when I was like a dwarf, you know, I, was like, I, had, I had to reconsider. I lost my enthusiasm for that. And, and uh, but someone did tell me when I was my first year of college, they said, you know, okay, they would tell all the, all the athletes to take art classes because they said, those are the easy classes. So <laughs> I was like, really? So, so I took an art class and uh, I took a drawing class the very first semester. And as I started to diminish my time in the gym, I started to increase my time in the classroom. And so that passion for, you know, basketball just kind of got transferred into art. And I found myself just, you know, getting more and more and more and more into it. And I'm, I'm a pretty, you know, pretty passionate person about things. Once I get in it, I'm in it. And, uh, and so that was my beginning. So I had no kind of early childhood, you know, connection. It was all started in college. Well, it strikes me it's so humorous that they said that art classes were the easiest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they haven't had, they haven't had, like, uh, they haven't had Liz Ward as a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's just joking, Liz. No. But. And if I recall correctly, you were making kind of landscape, almost pastoral works. Mm -hmm. and, but after college, you sort of moved into a more figurative and politically motivated genre, would you say? Yeah, when I, you know, I was just like, I didn't know what I was doing when I was taking art classes. I just showed up and they said, you know, draw this stuff. And I would draw it. We were drawing still lifes and stuff. And I was just happy to be there doing it. I wasn't as good as the other people in the class because obviously some of those people had been doing it for a long time. And, and I, but I was, some, I, I, you know, I worked hard, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I enjoyed it. You know, it was something that I found interesting. And, um, and then as I moved later semesters into painting, uh, it was a very conservative school and they taught landscape painting. And so I started doing landscape painting. That's what everybody was doing until it hit me though, that <clears throat> at a certain point that while I like the idea of doing the paintings, mm -hmm. there was something else that was, um, that I was told as I was beginning to understand art and what it did. Someone suggested to me one of the teachers was talking about the power of art to change lives you know and I and I was interested in that but I just didn't see that happening with landscape paintings you know and I was like I just can't continue to do this I have to figure out something else to do and so I um so I was the renegade student and I just started like doing figurative stuff I started you know uh doing drawings of things that I saw in newspapers and magazines that had political content to it. And, uh, and that just kind of took me out of the landscape realm. And I, and I moved into this area of just doing very, you know, didactic, political, um, almost you, some people might call it protest art. Right. So I think you have yeah. an image up here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's from, uh, I guess, 1988. Um, that was back then also what I, I was interested in doing art that connected with um, with the people that the art was about. So I would do a lot of these kind of installations in, you know, community centers, you know, at political rallies and that kind of stuff. But I also played the other side where I would try to do it in cultural institutions. And this piece just so happened to be in um, at the uh, Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston. And, um, and actually, and this, this piece was very, very interesting for me. It was one that was really, uh, you know, really close to me.
because this, this piece was done um, in commemoration of uh, Michael Donnell, who was a young black man who was lynched by the KKK in Mobile, Alabama in 1982, I think it was, 82, I think it was. And at that time, well, in 83, I was living in Mississippi, about 60 miles from Mobile. And nobody talked about that issue at all. It wasn't until 85 or so that there was an article in the New York Times that featured, that talked about that issue. And, uh, and I, was, I was stunned that I lived so close by and I knew nothing about it. And I was like, that could have been me. You know, I, I was you know, close to that age. He was, uh, I think Michael Donald was like 19 or 20 or whatever. And, uh, and so I made this piece uh, for that exhibition. And this was also during the time that uh, this guy from Louisiana, David Duke, who was, who was a uh, known member of the KKK, but he had kind of shed the robe and put on his suit and was running for Congress. But, you know, and to me, I was just thinking about how racism had kind of shifted and changed. And that, that's what that piece was all about. And, um, you know, and I, I was excited about doing this work. I felt like this work was, was, was meaningful and valuable at the time. Right. It was on, it was doing what you were, had heard about in the past. Yeah. Like making change. Trying yeah, to make absolutely. Change. Absolutely. Right. Trying to you know, affect people's lives. Right. Yeah. And then I think the next yeah, one. Yeah, the next one, actually. This this piece was like, this this, this was kind of like the pinnacle of that, that phase of my work. Um, uh, it was in response to police brutality, uh, pol two police killings in Houston. And, uh, and with, with, with that one, what I ended up doing, I started to figure out that I couldn't just make the work by itself and let it stand on its own. I had to create the context for it. And so I actually organized the press conference that all those people are sitting at. You know, I made the work and organized the press conference with all my mentors and activists that are, you know, in that image. Um, you know, you know, they, most of them didn't have any idea about when I told them I wanted to do this, this installation for the press conference. They didn't quite know what I was talking about, but once I built it, did it, they were all excited about it. And, and, uh, and I thought it was successful. It was, and, and I think it was successful because it, um, I mean, it was on the cover of like the Houston Chronicle, the Houston Post, the Houston Press. All the, all the local newspapers, all the television stations. So it was like, you know, what more can you ask for? At that time, I was like a, what, uh, 29, 30-year-old artist that, you know, it was great. But this was also the work that kind of, I, I, I met with a conflict there. And can I start talking about that a little bit? Well, yes, I but, mean, but can I yeah, ask one okay, more question? Yeah. So where was this installed? In uh, your studio? No, this was installed at um, a community center in the third ward that's called Shape Community Center. Okay. In fact, um, I can't remember the name of the organization from San Antonio that used to come to Shape Community Center every, um, oh God, every Memorial Day weekend, I think uh -huh. it was. Yeah, I can't remember. Uh, it's been so many years, but <laughs> yeah, anyway. So you had some people come through and one group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, so I just told you how successful this piece was for me, right? So on the heels of all that success, uh, a friend of mine brought his high school art students by my studio. And, uh, you know, and I had taken all this work down. It was all sitting around in my studio. And, um, and this one student, he was, he was very interested, you know, and he was talking about all the pieces that he could see and all the stuff. Complimentary. Mm -hmm. But then when he left, he came back, he said, well, Mr. Lowe, all your paintings and sculptures, you know, show what's happening in our communities. That's not what we live. We live in our communities. We live with it every day. We know what's happening. We don't need that. If artists are creative, why can't you create solutions? And I went like, what? <laughs> you, know, like, you know, I mean, that was one of the most devastating moments to have like, you know, a, 
a high school teenager, you know, to come along and just challenge me in, in such a way. And, you know, what's interesting about that, I find, I think about it now is that, you know, I mean, I could have obviously have, you know, really thought about it and said, you know what? Forget you. I mean, I've seen this. I mean, look, look at the activist felt like it was good. It worked. It did this and it did that. You know, I could have argued it. But, you know, the moment felt like I needed to contemplate that. Right. You know, I needed to think about it and see what, you know, what, you know, being contemplative in that moment would lead to. And, uh, yeah. So what did, you, what did you say when he said this? I think I just kind of like covered my head in shame or something. You know, I just, <laughs> you know, I just, uh, you know, turned away stunned, you know, because I mean, how do you, I couldn't come back to yeah. that. You know, I didn't, I didn't. I had no answer for that because right. in my head, I thought that, that, that I was, you know, right where I needed to be and was doing the best work that I right. could do. And, you know, and I still, like I say, thinking about it now, I can say you know, it was good work, but, yeah. but at that time that kid made me pause right. and it was the pause that I needed. Yeah. Yeah. Because at that point, then you start to develop the kernel of inspiration for Project Row House, which then... You continue to develop, I think, over, you said it took like a year, I think, before you really yeah. broke ground on yeah. things. And so I was just wondering, I mean, I think what's so amazing about Project Row House, there are a number of things, but that how it combines art, community, history, and architecture all in one. And and I'm wondering, like, how, how did you end up landing on these four kind of important tenets of the project. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, um, well, part of, part of the, the process of getting to Project Row Houses after this uh, student kind of, you know, shook my world up, you know, I went, I, I did what we do as artists. You know, you go back and you, you study, you read, and you try to understand, like, you know, what, you know, you try to look for precedents to do things that you might want to do. And I wanted to do something that made practical change. And I was trying to figure out, you know, who set a precedent for that to happen. And, and, um, and someone had shared with me a, um, uh, a book uh, with the title Energy Plan for Western Man by the, um, uh, the artist Joseph Boys, German artist. And I knew I had that book for years and, hadn't paid much attention to it, but one day I opened it up and I flipped through and on the second chapter, it was titled Social Sculpture. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what's that? And, 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 and it only took like the first two or three pages. I've read the first two or three pages of that chapter when he talked about social sculpture as, uh, as the way in which we shape and mold the world around us, you know? And, and he talks about how, you know, uh, uh, that everyone has to be an artist to shape and mold the world, you know. And 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 when it, when I read that, I start thinking about it and thinking about how, you know, what he was basically saying is, we if we think of the world, you know, as a sculpture, we're either sculpting it purposefully, you know, uh, in a, in a way that will bring forth this beauty, or we're we're being destructive to it. And, uh, and, and in my head, I'm thinking, well, okay, I can't shape, you know, the world, but maybe I can do a community, you know, and that's kind of the thing that started this idea. And, um, and the four parts, though, that you, that you mentioned, th those came about from uh, uh, an artist named John Biggers, who, uh, who was, um, he started the art department at Texas Southern University in Houston, our Historically black college there. And John Biggers had... You were his student, right? No, I never studied with him. Although I did learn a lot from him in my, um, my you know, kind of exploring the, the idea of Project Row Houses because his work was inspirational to me. He, John Biggers did lots of paintings about shotgun houses. And, um, and he had kind of, you know... Um, put them in a completely different context than most people thought of them. Most people think of shotgun houses as, you know, shacks and that kind of stuff. But John Biggers had put a, elevated them to this mythical level of like this kind of commu idyllic community mm -hmm. in which it was based on his, 
his experiences of the relationship of the shotgun house to West Africa. And so there's a lot of detailed stuff in that that I won't go into, but, one of the, but some of the things that John Biggers talked about that, that made these shotgun house communities so idyllic was that the architecture was, you know, extremely important in the way that those houses are designed with these common courtyards and the porches that allow people to kind of be in connection with each other. Uh, he talked about the importance of uh, art and creativity uh, in, in sh uh, these kind of shotgun communities. He also talked about the importance of education and then a social safety net. And so when we started with Project Row Houses, it was like, okay, so we've got these houses. Can we, can we make a living John Biggers painting as a social sculpture? And so those were two key elements of my thinking for that project. Well, and so we have actually uh, ah, John yeah. Biggers shotguns. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's, that's, the, um, that's one of the um, uh, signature John Biggers uh, shotgun paintings. And, and um, you know, and you can, you, you can see it. I mean, so different elements kind of um, appear in different paintings in different ways, but always the shotgun, the architecture becomes uh, uh, primary in the, in the composition of the paintings. It creates the structure of the painting. And then you have, the, you, then, you know, if you start looking deeply into the women on the porches and stuff, you'll see hints and uh, uh, references to the creative process mm -hmm. of like, weaving and making the tools and things that they use, you know, and then this whole notion about uh, uh, education being shared from one generation to the next, informal education, you know. Like, so all those things are in his works, you know, and I was able to kind of tease them out. Right, yep. absolutely. It, and it makes me think so much too of, oh my gosh, who was a writer who wrote about New York in the 50s and 60s when they were putting the highways through. and. She talks about how there was this built-in community of people looking out for each other before the mm -hmm. highways destroyed that. And that's essentially what you're restoring mm -hmm. in Project Row Houses. Yeah, abs that. absolutely. And, you know, the thing about Project Row Houses and that kind of um, John Biggers, you know, idyllic community um, formation, I think is very relevant. And there's so much, to me, the reason it was really important to to do that project was that, and for that project to sustain itself, which has been going now for 30 years, mm -hmm. is that it's, um, you know, it's important to, um, it's important as a lesson for people to look back on as Houston has been developing in most Texas cities, you know, developing in this way of, um, around the model of self-sufficiency, mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, it's designed where people would buy their house, right. you have a car, you drive your car into your garage, you know, you, you know, you're very self you don't right. need other stuff. And that's fine for people of a certain economic um, uh, status. But then when you get people that have, you know, single mothers, mm -hmm. you know, they're low income, they don't have cars, they don't have this, you know, there's a certain kind of uh, interdependence right. that, that is necessary for those, those kind of communities to operate. And we can't force folks into, you know, a, 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 a type of community that they're not economically capable to survive in. Right. And so, um, you know, I think this it's, it's Project Row Houses will, being there is a, is, is, a, is a way for people to kind of look at and kind of see maybe something that we forgot right. that we can pick up as we move forwards. And, you know, it, the thing about Project Row Houses is that, I mean, I grew up in Houston. Um, my, you know, I remember when it was being developed and I would see it and I would go by. And that's also one of the projects that I would take my parents to see and my dad. And my dad, Lord love him, is, you know, is, it, it, at times maybe drifts off when I talk about contemporary art, we take a <laughs> museum or is um, maybe shakes his head even. but. You know, it's funny because when I took him to Project Row House, it's like he got it right away. Like he understood. And I, and I, I wonder, like, is that what it was like when you were starting out? Did people understand that it could be this, you know, 
this, this incredible mixture of all of these different activities of which art was a part and art, you know, was kind of the umbrella for, I mean, was, or was, did you have to go on a long kind of, uh, shaking hands and kissing babies kind of campaign to get people to get on board? <laughs> well, you know, it's, um, I mean, you know, there were the people that just got it immediately. Um, you know, there were the people that just thought we were crazy. Yeah. You know, I mean, in fact, there are people that work for Project for Houses now from the community that uh, I talked to them. I mean, they would tell me this. They said, you know, for the first, you know, five or six years, they just, they lived across the street and they would sit and they would just watch us and they go, I don't know what those crazy people are doing over there, but they're, they're doing it. But which was actually, and that's another thing, that, that's one of the things though, that, you know, and I, I tell this to my students and I teach at University of Houston and I just tell students that, you know, one quality I think that it is important for mm -hmm. artists to have is to be a bit stubborn sometimes. Yeah. You know, that you just, you just, as if you, if you think you, if you, if you have something that you're, that, you know, an itch that you're trying to get to, you know, you just feel like you, your intuition tells you that there's something you want to do. You need to do it, whether it's in a painting or whatever, whatever kind of way. You just, and people may discourage you and this and that, but if you feel it, you just need to play it out to that end that you don't right. feel it anymore. And, um, and I, I think that was, you know, very helpful in yeah. the Project for Houses days because, you know, in the early days, I, you know, I mean, you know, people like young people ask me, you know, because they're interested in doing stuff and they say, well, where'd you get the resources from? I mean, where'd you get the money from and all this stuff? And, and I always tell them like, well, I never thought about it in terms of money. Mm -hmm. I always thought about it in terms of resources. And when you think about resources, then you can just always start, well, I've got one resource certain, and that's me, you yeah. know? And then, so what kind of resources that I have within, you know, and you just kind of go from there and you add people on and you have to believe in that because yeah, while it's, it's, you know, I could show photographs of the days when like lots of people around, right. but I can tell you there were many number of days when I would be sitting around when we were first doing with volunteers and all this stuff, you know, and some days we'd have, you know, 15, 20, 30 right. people. Some days it would just be me, mm -hmm. you know, and just, um, you know, having a, a commitment right. to just say, well, you know, I believe in this and I'm just going to keep going. So speaking of resources, the Emily Neff, the director of SAMA, she sent me an anecdote saying, because she couldn't be here tonight, but she said, I remember fondly my days of scraping paint <laughs> off the Project Row House building <laughs> mm. that I guess the MFA had sponsored. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So. Absolutely. Um, you know, and well, one thing I would say about this, though, is that <clears throat> and we, uh, someone said this early, and I was saying this, um, my response to, they were saying like, oh, San Antonio needs a project row houses. And my response to that is that, you know, well, San Antonio has a project row houses and it, it can happen in many different ways, but I think of Esperanza that way, you know, because it's the houses are, are symbolic of something that happened in Houston. Right. It's a Houston context and all that. And so all of that stuff in, in our cultural institutions and uh, churches and, you know, social groups and stuff and community fit within that context, right? That's right. Houston. But, you know, in other places, there are different contexts and they do it differently. But the point is just the, the real value of Project Row Houses was that it created a platform for the community to come together to show care right. in, you know, sculpting mm -hmm. that place. I mean, it just so happened to be, uh, little shotgun houses, but it could have been, you know, open land. It could have been, you know, gardening. It could have been an education, you know, just you know, a school. It could have been any, many different things. Yeah. Right. And I mean, it's that sort of site specificity that makes me think of, you know, the next question that I was thinking about was the fact that, you know, Project Row Houses is, it's so site specific. It was invested in your it was invested with your relationships in Houston, right? In a city that you know really well, in a place in, with people that you know really well. And then, but then you started to do more socially engaged projects outside of Houston. And I'm wondering, how did you 
know you even wanted to do something else or, or what made you take the leap? Because mm -hmm. that's, all, I mean, because you're already spending a lot of energy, right, with Project Row Houses. Mm -hmm. And then to do as another, pro and not on the same scale, certainly, but socially engaged projects are, they are rigorous yeah. when they're done well. And it takes a lot of energy and resources and just being present. So right. how did you make the decision to do another project somewhere else? Or maybe that was not a decision at all you had to think about. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, there are, um, I have been involved with some projects that were things that I, you know, I met people and I wanted to just help them out. Mm -hmm. And so it's not from any institutional support. So for instance, I have, a, I have an ongoing relationship with a group in Mobile, Alabama, in the neighborhood of Africatown, mm -hmm. which is a very fascinating yes. story. It's like, um, you know, uh, a, a group of um, captured Africans were brought on a ship to the Mobile Bay like 50 years after the abolition of slavery. And I, they just found the ship recently. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And that little community is there, you know, and, 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 and there's just, it's, that community has no support of anything, you know. And so I thought, you know, I'll be a resource to them and stuff. And I'm interested in that kind of, so I can, I do those kinds of things. Um, and then there are the kind, like uh, the uh, Vickery Meadow project in Dallas, which I don't know if there's an image of that. Oh, this is. This is Greece. Let me show the Vickery Meadow, um, you know, where that project in, um, in Dallas came about because the Nasher Sculpture Center invited me for their 10th anniversary uh, project. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, and I was able to, you know, that was, they invited me, so I responded to that. Then the other one that we'll show later uh, in Athens, Greece, mm -hmm. I was invited through Documenta, which is this international exhibition, to do that one. But um, but they all have, you know, it's so interesting. There are pros and cons right. to um, not having an institutional base and to have an institutional base. Um, obviously, having an institutional base means that you you, you have some resources and stuff. And, um, and otherwise, I mean, you have some, you have the, the resources of the institution, right. you know? And, um, but when you, when you don't, you have to, you just, you're, you're, it's much slower, you know? And, uh, and there's no time frame on it. You just kind of work your right. way through it. But this particular project in, uh, in Dallas, which was, a, you know, it was, it was great for me. It's a, what I find what I found over the years that practicing social sculpture mm -hmm. is the same as, you know, practicing sculpture, painting, or, you know, photography, whatever you're doing, you, 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 you do the, you don't just work on one thing. You want to work on many things. You practice. It's a practice of stuff. And so, you know, some people, you know, engage in a, a single project and they can stick with it. But for me, it, it didn't work. I have to practice in different ways and uh and I learned stuff so this was really interesting and fascinating for me because I had mostly worked in the context of African-American mm -hmm. um communities but this particular situation was with um the challenge the the community of uh that was that I became interested in was one of refugees right. and um uh, and I had never worked with refugees before, you know, immigrants or anything like that. And, uh, and so I, um, yeah, I, you know, found my way in and joined through and just kind of, you know, made this thing happen that was really, um, I mean, Randy was working at the, at the Nasher at the time when it was going on. And I just remember thinking about how, you know, there were people at the museum that was fairly skeptical uh -huh. of this project because Vickery Meadow was kind of thought of as one of the more dangerous places, you know, and, um, and, you know, and mainly it was, and that's, that was one of the reasons I was interested in it. I was interested in the, in this, in this idea of, of what I saw as a contradiction that, you know, we say that, uh, the thing that makes America great is that we're a diverse place. But then I said, I saw that this neighborhood was one of the most diverse places I've ever been. But then all of a sudden it's like, 
you know, one of the worst places to be. And I'm like, why is that? You know, how can we have a conversation around this? And to make a, to not go into too much detail on this and just kind of give you an, a sense of what this project was, was that what I observed, I mean, there was, there was this, this idea that was dangerous in, in the way that we deal with uh, the idea of crime, mostly in, in our cities is put more police you know, put more police. But I found a group of church ladies. They, they sought me out and they said, you should, we have a group for women and we don't have men come to this thing. But they heard me talk about the Young Mothers Program at Project Row Houses and all. They said, but we want you to come and sit and listen. You know, so, so I showed up. It was a Wednesday. They had, they had something to call the Mom's Lunch uh -huh. on Wednesdays. And they asked me, they invited me to come and I went and I sat in the back and it was one of the most amazing experiences that I've ever had because what these women had decided is that that while most people were saying that the problem with crime was coming from just bad people they thought maybe it was because people didn't know each other you know you ha you're throwing all these people from different places together they don't have any context with you know, and there were probably some bad people in there but they were taking advantage of the situation and so they thought Let's just pull people together. So they would host these lunches where they would have uh, about five to six people from you know, five or six different countries, and they'd eat together. And they'd all wear their traditional clothing and whatever. Wow. And it was amazing to sit there and watch them tell stories. Uh -huh. And some of the stories were so, some of them were so beautiful. Some were heart-wrenching, you know, with people saying, you know, oh, I'm a mother. I'm from uh, Bhutan, a mother of five. I have two children with me, but, uh, you know, two are, you know, still in another country and one, they don't know where they are. You know, yeah. I was all kind of stories. It's incredible. And, uh, and I, and they also serve food uh -huh. from different countries. And I thought if we could do something like this in a more public sense without, you know, in a way that's not exploiting it, mm that's a way to open this thing up to the city to get, you know, so that the city can benefit from this as opposed to it being a, a negative, right? And, um, and then I start to notice that people were trying to sell things on the street. And I said, oh, we should do a market, you know? And we came up with this idea of doing these markets in Vickery Meadow. And that's when the museum kind of was like, you know, nobody's going out to these markets. And, and uh, but we did them and they, they were just great. I mean, you know, and it became, you know, and we had these little outdoor galleries. That's one of the, what we call the white cube galleries. And I tell you, the white cube gallery came about because of, um, yeah, those came about because I was, we had had a, a few of the, the uh, markets and they were great and people were coming. And then we just had more and more uh, refugee artists coming forth. And some of them were like painters. I mean, like real painters, you know, and real, you know, sculptor made things, you know, and, and in our little market, we had mostly stuff that craft kind of things that people were putting on tables. But we said, uh, there was a guy named Amir. He made these great paintings. He was from Iraq. And we we're like, oh, we should show his paintings. Mm -hmm. And so we thought about getting another, uh, we were operating out of two apartment buildings in the middle of this huge apartment place. And we thought we could get another apartment place. Right. That was the original idea. But then I was talking to my friend, Mark Bradford, okay. who's an artist in LA. And Mark was just, uh, uh, he had just done a show at White Cube mm -hmm. uh, in London. And he was telling me it was the first time he was going to have a painting that was going to sell for over a million dollars. And he was like, yeah, you know, it's like this White Cube thing, man. They really got it down. You know, it's like if you, talk, if you, if you, you know, just calling it White Cube, you, you put something in a White Cube. It's like saying you're putting it on a pedestal. It makes it special. Well, it's, you know, we talked about other stuff, and I said, well, we need some white cubes in Dallas, right? <laughs> and so, so I went back, and I talked to some architects there, and I just put the challenge out. You know, I said, you know, hey, we're doing this project in this area, you know, and I have this idea of some white cubes, you know. Can you, I mean, just something simple. And these are the things they came up with, and we, um, you know, and they turned out to be these great, like, little exhibition spaces. Right. But, you know, they also served as, like, you know, bus shelters when it was raining, you know, because the street didn't have any infrastructure for, you know, pedestrians. And because the places were houses that were built in the 1970s around this 
self-sufficiency. Uh -huh. So, right. you know, there's, but then you get all these immigrants, I mean, refugees in, they need the, they need the street, you know, they need right. stuff on the street. So anyway, so that was, that was that whole project and uh, I enjoyed it. And what was key to that project for me though, was that it ran, uh, you know, an extra, uh, I guess, four and a half years mm -hmm. after the exhibition. Right. Yeah. That's, I mean, yeah, completely sustaining. It's incredible. Yeah. And, you know, this, one of your other projects that you did elsewhere, I have a picture from it, which is the Victoria Square project. Mm -hmm. And I pulled one image out from that series, which is an image of you playing dominoes. <laughs> and um, what is it? that would be, so there oh, yeah. the lower left. And if you go forward one more, here it is, blown up, which yep. is, so we see Rick there in yeah. the center, but next to him, for those of you who can't see, that's Suzanne Lacey, <laughs> which is like two heavyweights of yeah. the social practice movement there, yeah. playing dominoes. So tell me, so tell us, yeah. what is it about dominoes? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, um, I have a, um, a friend of mine who I, you know, when you get, you, you, know, you know, as you get older, you, you know, you're kind of your status, how you relate to people kind of shift. Mm -hmm. But um, so there's a young man here who drove me here. His name is Anjabir Matwaya, who started out at Project Row Houses, you know, like in the very beginning, he was like a kid, uh -huh. you know, that was hanging around, you know, like from, you know, middle school, high school, you know, and, um, and um, you know, he, he knows his story about the importance of, you know, playing dominant, how at Project Row Houses, the culture of community was around doing things that people in the community do, mm -hmm. you know, just the activities that they do all the time. You know, th there are ways, I mean, a lot of people think, I mean, you know, they want to get community input. They want to know what community is doing. And so they want to have like you know, town hall meetings, they don't want to have this, they don't want to have that, whatever. And that's all good, you know. But my, my sense of this is that I always thought, like, when you have a town hall meeting, generally what you get is the people who, who think they know everything or, you know, or, they, or, they, or they, they, they like the way they sound when they speak, you know. And, they, yes. you know, they'll just, they'll, they'll, they talk. And then the other people, they just sit back and right. just play their role. So you have those two, two dynamics. But then, but if you start, like, if you do things where people are being, you know, themselves in a casual, you know, environment, they'll tell you all kinds of things that you need to know and that you should know. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I, that's why I started playing dominoes at Project Four Houses. I, I'm not, a, I wasn't a, I never played, I played basketball. I didn't play board games and stuff. I mean, I just didn't, that wasn't a part of my thing. And, uh, but then as I, but as a, uh, community organizing tool, it became very important. And, um, and that translated itself to this project in Greece, because as I was working on this project, working again with um, uh, uh, refugees, yeah. this was after the, you know, the border mm -hmm. uh, crisis in 2015. And, um, and so there were refugees all over, um, uh, Athens and uh, and I had had this experience working in Dallas and I thought okay I want to you know carry this further and as we you know I found this location for the project and I remember like some of the local Greek artists were telling me that the space that I decided on they said you know that's a beautiful space it's a great space you know you've cleaned it up really good because we went and we got took off all the graffiti and yeah. clean it you know they said, but you know what? This is not going to last because there was a uh, an aggressive, what the Greeks call a fascist party, the Golden Dawn, uh -huh, yes. and they're like, you know, they're going to come through and they're going to smash this glass. They're going to do, you know, it's not going to work. And I was like, hmm. and they said, you should put it. You're going to have to put up bars over it. And I thought, no, that's going to ruin yeah. this. Like, okay, so then, but one day. I was there and I looked down the street and I saw these men huddled around and I went over and I went to see what they were doing. They were playing dominoes. <laughs> so I was like, hmm. So I watched for a while and I realized they're not playing like I play though. I don't know how, I don't know that game. So I watched long enough until I figured out the game that they were playing. Uh -huh. 
And then I, like, you know, the game was over. I kind of, like, lean in, you know, and they looked at me, and they started talking to me, but I didn't understand what they were saying. I knew they, they weren't speaking Greek, though, and I didn't, I didn't know what they were speaking. So, you know, I said, yeah, 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 yeah I want to, you know, and they, they let me sit down, and I played. And then someone came in who could speak English. They were Albanian and who translated. And then the translation started happening. I started telling them about what we were doing. And, um, and then they came down to look at the site. Then they, the Albanians on that block said, don't worry about it. We're going to take care of it. You don't have anything to worry about on this block. Everything's safe on this block. And so those, that guy that we're playing dominoes with, he was like the leader of the Albanians group on that block. And nothing ever happened on that block without him knowing about it, whatever. So it's like, you know, that kind of stuff, though, being able to to meet people with Mm -hmm. where they are, it becomes, you know, really important. And so Domino is such an important part of the social practice side, but it also has been very formative just formally to your painting practice. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how even maybe not so much in this work, but in others, how the dominoes have really factored into it. Or how, I guess that was the beginning, right, of yeah. some of your paintings. Yeah, so it's funny how all of this stuff, you know, I, you know I've just been on a ride, and I'm just riding with it, you know? I mean, I, I didn't set out, I didn't have a plan to say that I was going to, you know, do this kind of protest work and then I was going to switch and do this, you know, social sculpture and then switch to, all this stuff just happened very organically. I did not know while I was playing, you know, playing down, learning to play dominoes and playing dominoes that it was going to be the basis for me returning to painting. Mm -hmm. I had no idea of that, but I, I will tell you how that happened was that first of all, playing dominoes, I'm not that good. And mainly because I don't have the kind of focus that real domino players play. You know, I drift off. You know, I start thinking about other stuff and whatever and, you know, forget what, you know. And people get mad at me. And also what I found, though, that that while we were playing, I found myself really liking the chips as they lay out. You know, I would look at them, you know, and I caught myself after, you know, the, the, the era of iPhones, you know, when you could just pop out your iPhone and take a picture, I would, we would play a game and I would stop the game, hold on, stop, stop, and I'd like get up and take a picture of it, you know, and that would annoy people too, you know, because I'm stopping the flow of the game. So for years, I would just take these photographs, birds have you photographs of domino games. So then one day, um, uh, someone came in and uh, asked uh, one of my mentors, Jesse Lott, who's a great Houston artist, uh, who who believes in the economic value of art for all. So his goal is to always teach people, you know, from the community how to make stuff. He's like, you should be able to make things and and try to sell them. That's that's you know, you use your creativity, and uh, and he's he's trained quite a number of people, and so and what he tries to do is get them exposure through exhibitions. So someone came and asked, we were playing dominoes, and they came over and they asked, Mr. Jesse, they said, uh, I want to know if you would do a show with me. And, uh, and Jesse said, I will do a show with you if you let me put some of my community people in. And then the guy said, okay, well, you know, okay, I'll do that if you get Rick to be in the show. So, so then all of a sudden it came back to me, you know, I'm like, wait, 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 no, I don't, not me. I'm not, I don't do that. I'm not making objects and stuff. And Mr. Jesse said to me, he said, look, you're for the community, you know, and this is your chance. You, you know, if you don't put something in there and we don't do the show and these folks from the community don't get the show, that's on you. You have, you know, so, so then I was like, oh, so then I, I, kind of as a joke, there were these old posters that were sitting around from the early 80s, some old Mel Chen posters, actually. (laughs) And I I picked up one of those old posters and I put it down on the table when we played the game. And um, and at the end, instead of me taking a photograph, I traced it. Mm -hmm. I traced the domino game. And then we played another one. 
and I trace another one as a joke, right? I'm just tracing things, right? You know? And then Je Jesse didn't even know I was doing this, right? But in my head, I was like, I'm just going to do this joke on him. So I, after I traced the second one, then I pulled it out and said, here you go, Mr. Jesse. Here's your, draw here's your drawing for the show. And he looked at it. He looked and he goes, hmm, okay, sign it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, I signed I signed it and uh, and uh, and and it, and you know and then once it was framed it looked kind of like I was like hmm that looks kind of interesting and then I just then I just I, I started and then it and then what happened was after I started like tracing it multiple I mean like you know hundreds of times you know then all of a sudden it started looking like maps you know in which I was also that was really. That was really interesting for me. <laughs> I'm getting too excited up here now. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it was also interesting that they started to look like maps because that was also connected to my years of Project Row Houses as we started to kind of look at real estate development and gentrification in our community. And I'd start looking at a lot of maps and reading maps and studying maps and that kind of, and then all of a sudden these these images start to play you know into that and then like saying i know they start i mean this these are all i mean when folks look at these paintings they um you know they see something that is you know in, to the to the eye is abstract but in my way of constructing them is very much ruled by the laws of dominoes, of how domino chips come together and how games are played out. And I get to play around with color in that context. So if we advance one more, you can see yep. this is the lo Ruby, sorry, the lobby of Ruby City. And then one more, you can see the close up of the painting that's in our collection, which is a little bit more obvious to see maybe the domino play. Yeah. And then the kind of abstraction that Rick was talking about down below. So the two panel work, yeah. which is certainly you've done multi panel works, but yeah. I haven't seen many that are diptychs in this way. No, no, not like not in this kind of configuration. Um, and uh, and what is also interesting about about this piece, though, that you know, I mean, you know, the dots. You know, I mean, probably everybody's looking. You, you look and you see these dots, right? They're just dots, but if you know dominoes, you can see yeah. that there, there's a game, you know, there's a, you know, there's probably a, a, a five, three that's connected to a three, two that may be connected to a two, six. And, you know, so I'm playing out domino games, you know, and what's interesting about all these little, you know, the, the, the iconographies of, uh, of, of dominoes, whether it's the, the chip, the, you know, the, the, the rectangular chip, or the dots or whatever, is that they can also reference so many things. Right. You know, I mean, they, you know, dots reference things that are sold. Mm -hmm. You know, dots can represent, you know, movements of people or things when things move around, you know. And so I use it in so many different ways. And um, so it's, th th and this was the first piece that, um, that I used the dots on. Yeah, this is the very first one. I know that uh, I have many more questions. There's lots more to talk about, but I also want to be open this to questions that you all might have from the audience, because if so, there are microphones set up halfway down the aisles, and please feel free to stand up and ask a question of Rick. Mm -hmm. yeah. Otherwise, no. I'm about mine. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Well, you know, one of the things though, that I, I want to comment about, you know, this piece and the other piece too, is, um, is you know, the, the, you know um, like I said, I used the structure of the domino, the, the, you know, the the, 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 the iconography of the domino, mm -hmm. you know, to make the structure of the, the paintings, but then it leaves this opportunity for me to play with color, you know, and and the color comes in, it's, you know, some artists have like a, you know, a particular approach to the palette, right. but, you know, I, I don't, you know, I mean, I kind of allow things to kind of 
you know, uh, uh, respond, you know, each and every color within uh, the painting in general is a response to something else that happened, right. you know, and so it's not like an overall, um, except for when you go, can you go back to the Victoria Square project painting? That, that particular painting, um, while there's a lot of incidental kind of color stuff there, but, um, but there was a, 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 an intentionality around um, trying to find the colors that I remember of experiencing my first trip to Greece. Uh -huh. You know, those kind of, you know, pale blues and, you know, kind of peachy colors, pink colors and that kind of stuff. Those are, you know, so sometimes I will try to use that, mm -hmm. you know. But in general, it's generally, it's like, it's in response to something. Right. You know, if I, you know, it, the, that response could be, you know, what colors are available in the studio right now that's already mixed and I just lay that down and see what happens and then just kind of evolves over. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I think the thing that's interesting too about the paintings that you talk about is that, like you were saying, that they remind you of a particular place mm -hmm. or time, but they are, they are, they serve in your mind, almost as archival documents, records mm -hmm. of these, of the social project pro projects that you're doing. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And this one that's up now is, you know, so, you know, it, most of the work that I do, you know, I like to retain the freedom to just explore mm -hmm. and just, you know, allow it to be open ended. What you know, and people can find their own narratives of what they see or they think in it. But then there are other times that I, I, I think, you know, well, maybe, well, I started to have this, this, this thinking that the, the community projects that I've worked on, while Project Roads is still going, but most of them have ceased to exist. And so how do those projects live going forward? You know, how do, you know, I mean, how, how does something that's ephemeral, like a community project, uh, you know, uh, hold its artistic identity, you know, over time? And, uh, and then I, I just came up with this idea that, like, maybe, maybe the paintings could become archives, you know, of these projects. And not archives in the way that we think of, you know, kind of traditional archiving, but but just maybe it's in the title of it, you know, in certain elements. So this particular piece um, is called Project Row Houses, Biggers and Boys. And what's important about that, that, that work for me is that, I mean, it's, it's composed if you, over, of um, an image of Project Row Houses, an image of a John Biggers painting, and a book cover of Joseph Boy's um, book, Energy Plan for Western Man. And, you know, and it's all mushed together and it's collaged and so it's not like a clear narrative thing. So it's an abstract work. But what's important though is in the title, that the title holds that for the future. You know, and so in the future, if Project Row Houses is no longer around, this work is around, then there's an opportunity for somebody to question, you know, what is this project row houses? What is this biggers? And what is this, you know, what is this? And then they'll start to, 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 to um, you know, hope, in my mind, it was a way to honor also John Biggers, you know, who most people have kind of mostly acknowledged him as a more regional artist, whereas Joseph Boys is this international artist. And I'm trying to pull them in the same space, you know, so they're in the same space that, you know, if this painting's around the next, you know, 50, 100, or however long this painting's around, then John Biggers is around right. with Joseph Boys, you know, and that, that's kind of the, the thinking on that is being able to, to, um, to, to have. Inserting him yeah. into the record. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So if, if the projects inform so much of your paintings, maybe not directly, but in a larger sense, do your paintings inform the social practice projects in some way or another? You know, 
That's a very good question, too, because I think, actually, it, it took me a long time to figure this out. But you know what? I think the paintings um, makes it possible to do the social practice projects now. Oh, in what way? Because what I, I you know, and I, I'm sure, I'm sure Graciela understand this, too. Like, you know, when you've been working you know, for decades, it's like, it's, it's so, it's demanding. I mean, and it is like, you know, there's hardly time to breathe and think because everything is, 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 um, you know, it's so necessary. It's, you know, it's, yeah, you don't have space to, to, to reflect. And, um, and I think for me, I was getting to that point where, I really kind of didn't know where I needed to be within the practice of social sculpture. I didn't know where it was. And, uh, and so painting allows me that, that, that space to be able to reflect while I, you know, to, to be complementary to my work in the community and not to replace it, but to complement, to be able to enable. It's like, you know, it's, it's like, you know, the, you know, the, you know, you can't work all day. You have to go home and eat, right? So it's like, it's me going to the studio to eat, right. feed my soul, mm -hmm. to be able to get back to work on the other, on the other work. Right. Yeah. Um, are there, I, if there aren't any questions, I will end by asking you, uh, Rick, you know, is there some, is there a project or a project that you're dying to do, whether it's in painting or social practice, something that you're, really longing um well you know i mean th there are some 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 i wouldn't say that a particular project but you know i think i mentioned this to you earlier that i've just been i've been knocking at the door of working on a project with david ajay mm -hmm. uh for the last 20 years uh he's the architect of um, ruby city uh, we started working together way back in 2003 and on a project that did not come to mm -hmm. fruition in Seattle. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and, you know, every, probably every five to seven years since then, we would come together and, right. and, and, and make an attempt on something. Uh -huh. and, uh, and we're in that, that space now where we're, we're, we're playing around with something that I, if it happens, I can't talk details now right. because I don't want to. Jinx it, but you know, it's, it's going to be really great. Yeah. It'll be fantastic. Well, I like to think that this is your first collaboration with David. <laughs> your painting installed at Ruby City. So. Absol absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I'm going to send him an image of that and tell it because he, well, yeah. I will I'll he, send you this image so you can share it with him. <laughs> well, yeah. Rick, I'm is dying it, to, oh, do you have a question? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I was just curious how you view authorship of your legacy of this whole thing that you've created over the years. Wait, can you, wait, say that again. How do you, can you reflect on your, the authorship, how oh. it's been created? Is it yours? Is it the community's? Is it, how does it work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, authorship is, 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 is a very interesting, um, uh, uh, it's an interesting question in the whole field of social and community engaged work social sculpture, whatever. And I've always, I've, I've always, you know, tried to approach it from the standpoint and the perspective that if it's a social sculpture project, whoever is working in it is or should be working in it as an artist and they have their own narrative about it, you know, and they have, so they have their own authorship about what it is. And that's why I think with Project Row Houses, uh, and as time goes on, you'll find there, there are probably going to be multiple narratives about, you know, the authorship of Project Row Houses. You know, in other projects I've worked on, there are multiple narratives. And I don't try to claim them. You know, I don't try to own them. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, there, you know, there will be people that say, oh, well, th this person was the leader. And then, well, they were. Maybe they were. I don't know. You know, I mean, I know what I know what my intent was as an artist 
working in the project. And that's the, that's the, the narrative that I tell, and that's my authorship. But the other person who worked in it, they, they have their, you know, perspective. Now, you know, there is the, um, you know, it is just natural that for people that, you know, kind of have play the, the stronger part or maybe the more public part will uh, garner most of the acknowledgement of, you know, the, um, uh, the ownership of the project. But, but, you know, when we started Project Row Houses, um, and if you listen to, look at a lot of the uh, uh, information about Project Row Houses, some just say, well, Rick Lowe is the founder. Some say Rick Lowe is a co-founder, you know, and, that, and there are many co-founders, you know, and that's all great, you know, and they, I don't have a problem with that. Um, I'm not sure if you would be able, uh, be willing to answer this, but that uh -oh. specific piece, <laughs> um, I just wanted to know, do you think you could maybe talk a little bit about, um, how you would interpret your own work? Like what are some conscious decisions that you have on there besides, uh, the dots that you mentioned and the dominoes as well, maybe uh, about the color or, uh, mm -hmm the mm. composition of it. I remember when I saw it in person, I, for some reason, was fixated on this line that's like kind of at the third bottom right. part of it. Right, yeah, yeah. Oh, are you finished? Is that... Yeah, I'm finished. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Now, I mean, with, with this piece, you know, so as I said, you know, I'm, I'm building, you know, a, um, I'm using the, the I just collaged on, like these are little domino chips that I've, cut out of paper and collage them on. And so, you know, as I'm starting, if you look closely under the, the yellow greenish color at the top, you know, there are domino patterns that's not, you know, that's not, uh, that have no accent color on it, right? This just blends in. And so, you know, what I'm doing, you know, in that situation, I'm starting out you know, with just kind of trying to build a composition. And then all of a sudden I realized like, okay, you know, I need something to, uh, uh, that will complement this kind of odd color that I've come up with, this greenish like color. It was kind of an odd color that I came up with. And so I went in with this white, right? That was my first, you know, effort to go in with that and you create, and then I just, and then as I started to, to uh, move, downward, you know, into it, and I had, you know, the full thing was this kind of green, um, green and white. You know, it's so funny, too, how, like, you know, for those who make painting and sculpture, sometimes you just think, like, you know, this is a complete painting as it is, but then you move beyond that, so you can make several paintings in a painting, right? And as I think about it now, and I think I have images of it, like, when it was just the kind of green and white, it was a it was a painting, but if I hadn't have gone in with the red, you know, went in with the red, I would have never brought the dots in. The dots were not there. And I think the dots were key, you know, to this painting to, to, to build out the composition the way I wanted to. So it's just, you know, it's just, a, it's a process of me kind of setting up these uh, challenges within the work and trying to solve it. And then, and this lower portion is, is the outline of dominoes yeah. that correct? that's been just layered and layered and layered. And right. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, what's, what's interesting about this painting too, though, is that when I think about the earlier stage with it just being uh, the green and white, it was a very, it was, it was almost, a, it was a minimal mm -hmm. kind of painting that, that, um, that worked compositionally, mm -hmm. but it didn't have the kind of, and I guess that's where the, the whole thing of like, you know, how your emotional state and sensibilities come in. I mean, I wasn't in that place. I wanted something that had, that, that had a more punch to it and more, you know, that, 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 um, that, 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 that was a little more disruptive to the mind than just the calmness of those, those two colors. Right. And the, 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 did you always conceive of it as two portions or did the second one come later or the top one come later? 
No, this one came as as always on yeah two. because okay i have another thing that that's that's also that happened you know just it was very um you know it wasn't something that i was kind of a strategy it just naturally happened back when i was doing the 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 political paintings and stuff i was painting on plywood at the time and there was a four by eight sheets of that's why I have my big truck with the long bed. I got to put the four by eight sheets of plywood. <laughs> you know, it, uh, that's a conversation from earlier. But anyway, um, but uh, but you know, and I always like to work large, and I knew that I wanted to make, you know, this is you know, larger pieces. But I I'm in a small studio, so being able to make them with uh, in, in, in parts, you know, in panels. That's why I used to use the, the, um, uh, the plywood. I would use, you know, you know, one four by eight sheet of plywood be a painting that size. And then if I add another, it would be eight by eight. And I can add another eight by 12, you know, just kind of move that way. And so with this one, it was like, okay, you know, I want, you know, you know I want to have like a, a, a nine foot painting but I, don't, I can't get a nine foot painting, you know, in out. So how do I do that? Oh, I just make it in sections. Yeah. Yes. Hi, do you have any weird uh, or unique things that have to be a certain way for you to start creating like coffee, music? Hmm. 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 <laughs> uh, not really. I, I think, though, probably if there's any kind of, like, little weird thing for me, and I was just talking to Angevier on the way over, driving over, was that I do have a thing, like, I mean, nowadays, I, I kind of almost, I have to have a student, I have, have help with certain aspects of the work, you know, and, uh, but I really don't like people around when I'm working, you know, because it's like my, you know, it's like my sanctuary, you know, and as long as you know, sometimes the Holy Ghost come in there, you know, I mean, you know, if the music's right, you know, and the, you know, and I'm feeling, you know, if it's raining outside and, you know, the weather makes an impact, you know, it's just, you know, I, I, I allow myself and I like to allow myself to just get as emotional as I want to be in my sanctuary, in my studio. You know, but I don't have I don't have any particular thing that I you know that that get me there because I don't I don't I don't necessarily go to the studio trying to get to a particular place. You know, I just try to see what where am I gonna, where am I going to end up? You know, and there are different things that will contribute to getting you know in different different places. So. Yeah. Well, Rick, thank you so much. Oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> one. We've got one more question. Okay. I think this should be our last. Thank you. Okay, so Rick, when I first met you 30 years ago, I didn't even know you were an artist, but you were beautiful with your long dreadlocks down to your back and all that. And, um, I just thought you were a preservationist when I, <laughs> I heard you speak in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, and and let me tell you, project. let me tell you, I came up with a term that I call trespassing, you know, for the work that I do, because I end up doing things that I'm not like, you know, licensed to do or trained to do. Or, <laughs> and, and I tell you, preservation is never thought I was a preservationist. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we haven't talked about it tonight. And I, I, I see your new role. And I love that. And I'm an artist and an activist, too, and a preservationist. Um, and once you're a preservationist, you never can stop being a preservationist. Am I right? Well, so, uh, okay. Now, let me declare. The reason I said I'm, I'm preservationist when never think I was a preservationist because I used to fight with them all the time. Because, because I, was, I am a preservationist about, you know, the preservation of community, yeah, you know, and yeah. culture and stuff. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. for pres preservation for me it would push bump heads because a lot of the preservationists that you know, they're, they're architectural in nature. You know, they're interested in doorknobs and, you know, <laughs> frames and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's like, I don't care about that. I want to, you know, the people, how, how do we, you know, anyway. But yeah, yeah but once, once you are, you always are, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Mm, I right. love you. Okay, love you. thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yep. Okay. Well,
So we're, we're done. Yeah, we all, all right, love you thank too. You all. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, everybody. Yep. So I, I feel like before we go, I also just want to say a thank you, a hearty thank you to the Carver. Cassandra, thank you so much for being our great partner in Tayer Talks. Ernie, thank you so much. And Derek, thank you for your help tonight. And a big hearty thanks to the Ruby City team, especially Randy Guthmiller for organizing this event. So thank you. Thank you to the Ruby City team. And Rick, again, thank you.